Welcome to the Swim Swim Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, we've got a very special guest. He is a 2012 Olympian, 2012 Olympic champion, two-time world champion, uh, two-time team NCAA champion. He's now the head coach at Opelika Swim Team, Tyler McGill. Tyler, how's it going, man? It's good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. Start with the here and now. Um, you, you're the head coach at, at a club team in Opelika, Alabama. Um, tell me about that. Tell me about how you ended up there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when um, staff changes happened at Auburn three years ago now, um, mm-hmm. my wife was working for the university, and we were talking about what we wanted to do, what we wanted, to, where we wanted to be, um, and really, our commitment was to stay in the area. We love the Auburn Opelika area. Um, It's been great to raise kids here. And so we just thought like, hey, let's figure out a way to stay here. And so we were just exploring different options for me and trying to figure out what was available. And so uh, City of Opelika reached out and they were looking to grow a swim program and they saw value in swimming and they saw a benefit for the community and uh, having a good swim program. So in meeting with the mayor and meeting with other community leaders, it became pretty much a no-brainer of like, okay, yeah, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can grow. So um, we haven't moved. We've been in the area um, ever since 2005, 2006, when we moved down from California and Illinois. So we certainly made this place our home. Yeah. And so, so I did, I, I did not realize that you've grown this swim team from, from the ground up. Uh, Well, it hadn't necessarily been from the ground up, right? So, in, in Alabama, the park and rec swimming world is a is competitive um, to some extent. Okay. And so there's always been a, a swimming park and rec program. And then in the winter, there'd be a handful of kids that would swim USA. Um, but there, it wasn't much more than that. It was, hey, we love to swim and we want to do this more than just in the summer. So there was always anywhere between 30 and 40 kids that would keep swimming. Um, not all competitively, but they just, they love the activity and love to do it. And so my role has been to grow that group and continue to grow that, um, that community and that, that swimming literacy in the area and um, start a swim school within the city and, and really get people to invest into being in the water and invest into what it means to learn how to swim and, and all the, the benefits that come with life when you do. So I mean, Alabama is a very rural state, lots of outdoors activities. And so to be able to be around water safely and comfortably your whole life has been um, a good thing to work on here as well. Definitely. So, I mean, <clears throat> what has that process been like for you? Again, you mentioned not necessarily from the ground up, but certainly you are growing that team, growing the club side of the program. Right. Um, man, challenging for sure. I think when you go from, Olympic athlete to um, coaching potential Olympic athletes and high, high achieving, very goal oriented athletes, and then have to step back and say, okay, now I'm working with kids who are, whether learning to swim or developing a love for the sport, um, making that shift was a challenge. I mean, it's a big challenge to go from that end into the other. Um, But what I found was the things that I wasn't doing before, like appreciating all the little victories in swimming, uh, became much easier to celebrate. And so there certainly came a, jo- a, a bigger joy of working with kids who are eight, you know, eight through 15, 16 years old and being able to say, hey, l- listen, this was a huge success and this is why. And they're high five and then they're excited about it. And it had nothing to do with going at time. It had everything to do with uh, just the development and the joy of being in the water. So um, it was challenging, but then it became really easy to do once you realize what the focus on those kids should be. Yeah. 
And and so where <clears throat> from where you're at right now, where where do you go moving forward um, for this swim team? Did you guys, you know, what have the last six months looked like in particular? Um, did you guys get, you know, obviously I'm guessing you were affected by, by this yeah. quarantine. Sure. I think, yeah, when we, um, we closed things down in, in mid March, like everybody else. And, um, when the governor of Alabama opened up the beaches and the hotels down at the, uh, you know, at the Gulf, um, just mm-hmm. in communication with the city, we were able to get kids back in the water, um, in early May. And that was at a very, very small, uh, capacity, eight kids at a time. And, um, just getting them back into the swing of learning fundamental details. So taking for us at that time, we had been out of the water for six weeks, seven weeks. And so when we got back in, it was, Hey, let's relearn how to do streamlines the right way. Let's relearn how to do very simple things that we take for granted the right way. Um, and so we've been, we've been in the water for several months now and, um, are now building, you know, into our training and building into some racing. And so, uh, we actually hosted a meet last weekend um, and that was exciting. And the kids were all pumped to be able to race again and have times count to some extent um, and see improvements and have fun with that. So it's been a journey, but I, I feel like we're moving in the right direction. And um, I think the kids are excited to, to then have another more opportunities down the road to keep racing and keep getting better. Definitely. That, that sounds like a very cool opportunity and, and a very, cool thing to, to get to grow and, and kind of spearhead in that, in that area. Um, like you mentioned, you know, Alabama is a rural state. You came from California or sorry, you, you came from Illinois. Your wife came from California. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, so, you know, when you were being recruited in, in 2006, uh, what what inspired you know i've i've been to auburn and and i i have to say i don't really get it you know it's like to me it's kind of like this small this very small college town and and, but but you talk to people who go to auburn who are from auburn and i mean there is something special going on there right um what what drew you to go there when, when you were a 17 year old kid from illinois yeah and for those who live in Illinois or have been around high school swimming in states where high school swimming is big. So you think Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, California, Texas, these schools and these states where like it means something big to represent your high school at the swimming level. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I experienced that in Illinois and had, was on some teams through high school that we would finish fourth or fifth in state meet and had a lot of fun doing that, but I wanted to win stuff. <laughs> So um, when I was looking at schools, I was thinking, okay, where can I go and contribute to a team that has got things figured out and, um, and I want to win. And so that was my first draw to Auburn um, was just the team dynamic and wanting to contribute to that. And then other things fell into place. Right. So, and little things like I grew up in a college town, Champaign, Illinois, there was no swimming team there. When I got to Auburn, it felt like a small college town felt like home where I had grown up. Um, the, the colors for Illinois and Auburn are basically <laughs> identical. Orange is orange right. and blue. And so like we were in the car and my mom saying, well, at least I won't have to change my, my wardrobe in my closet to, to match Auburn. And so all these little things started to go into place and started to make me feel more and more comfortable. Um, but at the end of the day, it was like, okay, all of that's great, but I don't want to be successful. I want to swim fast. I want to perform. I want to be a part of winning teams. Can I do that at Auburn? Is it possible to do that at Auburn? Um, and so at that point, it was easy. It's like, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's move 10 hours from home and um, let's figure it out. Yeah. And so you get you get to Auburn. You guys, <laughs> like you said, you won. The, the first year you were there in 2007, uh, Auburn won the national title. I think it was like their fourth or fifth in a row. Um, yeah. at that point, what, what surprised you the most with that first season when you got there? I think it was the, the people that had never done anything before had never scored points, never, never been an NCAA final, never been on relays. I mean, that team in 2007 had a lot of question marks. I mean, I remember sitting on the pool deck in November with, with, uh, the men and David and David basically being like, who's it going to be? 
right? Because right now this team, based on what it's done in the past, is not going to win this year. You know, there was no more Eric Chanteau and uh, Kurt Katie and Doug Van Wee and George Bavell. Like all these guys who had been on these teams for four years and never lost, they're gone. Um, and so who's going to step up? And so you had seniors like Brian Lundquist and John Scott, um, guys that basically said, okay, we're, we're going to win. James White, you know, and, and this is how we're going to do it. And it's going to be a collective effort. And so there were so many guys on that team who had never made NCAAs before, never scored NCAAs before, and just tore it up. Um, and, I mean, that was one of Auburn's most dominant NCAA titles in 2007. Um, not their best, but still, I think after the first day, we knew what the weekend was going to hold. So um, lots of guys stepping up when you didn't think they would in September, October. That's for, for me as a swim fan, that's so interesting to hear. Cause like all I remember about 2007 was, was Cesar, right. Yeah. Just going 18 and 40 point And uh, you know, it's like hit him going really fast, but I didn't really know any of the other guys on Auburn. And then you say those names was like, Oh yeah. Okay. I know who that is. I know who that yeah. is. Like didn't realize that they, you know, they were just starting to blossom in their careers Right. Um, as well. And kind of, that was the motivating factor behind that. To, I mean, what was that winter, you know, after that meeting heading into NCAAs that January, February training, what was that like for you guys? I mean, could you feel it, it pretty much in the air every day? I think the first time we really felt like we had a team that could dominate and do well, um, at least in my opinion, now the, the older swimmers probably felt it more earlier so as a freshman your mm. your head's down and you're grinding and you're trying to figure out how you can contribute and what you can do um and so the first time i really felt that confidence was at our last chance meet i mean you're talking about two weeks before ncas and yeah guys are popping off best times and we gather around afterwards and again it's I mean, it makes david great he's like he gathered everyone around the guys and the girls said listen all we have to do in two weeks, three weeks, whatever it was going to be, is go best time, right? Like be a little bit better than what you've been and we're going to win this thing. And so I was like, oh, that's easy. Yeah, I can do that. Like I know that I've done enough work that there's rest still in me. And I know that there's um, enough of us who've experienced that. It's like, we can do this. This is going to be awesome. So for me, I, it took the entire year to feel that confidence. But um, I think with some of the older guys, they probably saw the momentum coming a lot earlier. And so like, I know that in 2009, I felt that momentum a lot earlier. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm sure they knew it just took some of us younger guys more time to figure it out. Yeah. Do, do you have a favorite swim from that 2007 NCAA championships? Obviously you said after the first day of the meet, you guys were like, Oh, well, like we kind of know, we kind of know what's coming. Did, what, what was your most memorable, uh, swim from that meet um yeah and, and they they have nothing to do with me um they had, like zero to do with me um i would say like on day one um watching james white qualify for the final in the 200 im was pretty like inspiring to our team uh, james is a phenomenal swimmer i mean started his career at wisconsin was an unbelievable swimmer his first year at wisconsin great at auburn when he when he transferred down to auburn um but james basically couldn't really walk for about three months that fall. Um, just had bad back problems. And, and just, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this guy is a huge part of this team and he can barely move. Mm -hmm. And so to see him then finish top eight in the tournament I am, I remember that being one of those swims where it was like, oh wow, like, okay, there's, there's one thing that gets the ball rolling. Um, and then, you know, the next day there's more of that, you know, James Maris and 100 breaststroke any way to to be i think he was top eight um and so there was those kind of swims uh sean osborne same idea like a senior who had never scored breaststroke and is now in the top eight and then the biggest one for me was um john scott tuner butterflyer again john never met, made ncas but never scored or done anything mm -hmm. um and then the last day gets second place is like a stroke away from winning the tuner butterfly uh, his senior year after never scoring. I mean, that doesn't happen, right? Like nowadays, everyone pretty much knows who's going to, like, by the time you're a senior, you know where you are, especially if you've never done anything. And so 
like him and Logan Madsen, and again, all these guys that people don't know and, and don't remember. But for us on that team back then, like that's what made that team so amazing. Is like those guys were successful, and so not my swims that year for sure, but seeing those other guys perform um, certainly got the the team going. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think, I don't know, certainly I I've had team experiences like that. Hopefully, hopefully many swimmers have where, you know, it's not really one person or the other. It's kind of the collective coming together. And again, I think that's what makes swimming such a fun sport, such a team sport. Um, even though, you know, you are sticking to your own lane. Um, but you know, you can really rally around your teammates and, and have that be a group effort and have it be something bigger than yourself. <clears throat> um, so for you personally, as you kind of moved through your time at Auburn, um, I, I, I'm thinking you came in as, as kind of a mid, a mid distance guy, you know, you're swimming 200 fly, you were on the 800 free relay. Did, and, and I, I think of you as a hundred flyer. Uh, as, right. as more of a sprint guy, did, did you, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> did you kind of move in that direction as you moved through your time at Auburn? Um, honestly, I, it's something that when I was in high school, I mean, I was a junior national champion in the hundred fly before I got to Auburn. Um, so the summer okay. before I got to Auburn, the hundred fly, like, I was like, this is my, this is my event. Um, I think I bet one back then, like 54, three. And like nowadays, 54, three at a junior <laughs> level, it's like, you don't even make top 16. And so it's crazy to think that in 2005, that's or six, that was the winning time. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I got, yeah, I was, I, I was training for the 500, 400 IM, 200 IM, 200 fly. And I think that's because I, I did that to myself a little bit. I remember on my recruiting trip with David and he's like, so what do you think you can do like really well? I was like, anything. Like put me in anything and I'll figure out how to do it well. I think he took that to heart. He was like, okay, well, 500 free, 400 I am, 200 fly, backstroke, whatever it is. Um, and so we're going into the SEC championships my freshman year and I'm doing some 500 pace. And so I'm doing like the first 250 of my 500. And I think I'd go like 207 for a 250. And I'm thinking, I'm like, I could go under 420. And again, 420 was like this amazing threshold that guys were trying to get under back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but my butterfly was feeling good. And so uh, Brian Barnes was my, was my coach at the time. And I said, Hey, Brian, what would happen if I got up on the block right now and I went 47 and hundred fly, would that change my event order at SECs? Cause I really did not want to do the 400 I am at that <laughs> point. I think I'd done it twice in my career and I wasn't good at it. So so I, yeah, we'll see what we can do. So um, I get up there and do a hundred fly and Brian's like, great swim, 48, two. I was like, all right, well, I guess it's just what it is. <laughs> um, and so years later on this story comes back up and I'm talking to Brian about it. He's like, Oh no, you definitely went 47 that day, but I couldn't tell you because I needed you to still think that you could do the porn <laughs> I am also. Um <laughs> I still give him a hard time about that. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of when the transition happened. Uh, freshman year, SEC's getting pulled out of the 400 IM and um, getting put in the 100 fly, kind of started that transition. And then the 100 wait, fly. Wait, became, so you did get pulled out of the 400 IM? I was entered in. Yeah, I did the 500 <laughs> friend the first day. It was terrible. Um, it was bad. You didn't break 420? No, I think I went like 428 or 420. I mean, it's terrible. It wasn't good okay. at all, but I scored 16th place or something like that. And nice. uh, so I got the one point I contributed on the first day. And then the next day um, they put me in the hundred fly. And so I still feel bad. I had a roommate, uh, his name's Will Dove and he was in the 200 free and they switched us out. He put, got put in the 400 IM and I went in the hundred fly. And so, oh no. Um, but anyway, yeah. So that was kind of the transition. And then that event became, are still becoming like a, a men's event, right? Like it is not like you have to be a man to swim that event. Like it is not for um, like the younger developing swimmer at, at the major level, right? There is plenty of fast younger kids in hundred fly. And I get that. But if you want to be successful at that event in the college level or beyond, like there is a certain amount of, maturity that your body has to go through and development strength wise. And so at that point, 
yeah, my strength got better over the course of the next couple of years. And that became a better event for me, especially long course. So, um, but that was the first moment where it was like, okay, I'm, I think I might be a hundred flyer, 200 flyer. <clears throat> Did what was that the was freshman year the last time you swam the 500 free at a conference meet yes yeah that was <laughs> yeah that was the last time yeah that was um I, I you know i think i i might have like touched somebody out in a florida dual meet and gone like 434 in a dual meet and the coach was like, <laughs> all right he's got it and uh <laughs> it, just, it wasn't me all right it just it wasn't suited for me i could still muscle out of 500 if i needed to but um it was not my best event. Uh, so the, the, uh, the transition to IM came at that point and uh, some of the more of the sprint. So um, I think it was a great move on the coach's part to take me out of those <laughs> events. Nice. Uh, so, I mean, that, I, I imagine for most people that always feels good um, to be able to transition from 500 forward IM to, you know, two IM 50 free hundred fly type of, type of schedule. Um, so congratulations. Uh, yeah. So tell me, tell me about the, the, I guess the contrast of, of 2008 to 2009 and 2008, I think you guys got third. Um, I know Arizona won. Yeah. I think we were fifth. Yeah. Oh, we wow. Okay. Fifth. Um, and then 2009, you guys elevate and, and get back up on top. Um, oh. what, what, what happened from an insider's perspective for you guys, those couple of years? I think in 2008, we were missing the, the voice on the team that said we needed to be doing more, right? Like we were working hard. Don't get me wrong. I, the leaders on the team that year, um, Luke Winnegar, Scott Goodrich, I mean, guys that invested a ton of the team. Um, but we had just come off five championships in a row mm -hmm. and like maintaining that is a huge challenge. And I remember uh, that group thinking, well, we'll just do the same thing we did last year. We've got a bunch of guys who have left the team that were big time scorers. And we've got guys who are coming up and joining the team that we feel like can contribute. And we'll just do the same thing. And, and it didn't have the same urgency as it did the year before. And we still had great performances. I mean, we won plenty of relays. We had guys that swam well. Um, but you know, a story from that year is we, we had made these shirts, um, the movie, uh, the movie Invictus came out that year. And so, um, you know, we, we had these shirts, we made these shirts and on the back, it said Invictus and for, you know, it meant kind of an unconquerable type of thing. And, um, I remember being in the car or on the bus at, at NCAAs and we were supposed to wear these shirts that said Invictus on the back of them going into the last day. And I looked at our weight coach and I was like, tell the coaches we're not wearing those shirts. Like we have not lived up to that, to that shirt. And we're not going to wear it. Um, and there was a lot of things that went into that. And so I think there was a, a huge shift in the way that we talked to each other, the way that we communicated as a team, the, the urgency that we had in 2008 versus 2009. And then you add in the Richard quick element of his illness and his, um, his impact on the team over that year and a half and now having something motivating, inspiring added into that mix, like this perfect storm came around with that team and a lot went into that 09 championship. Um, but there's a huge shift, even in the spring of 2008, like this is what we need to move towards. Um, and so that 2009 championship team was already well in the works a year prior, uh, but just added in extra elements that, now pull out the best in people. And so um, huge shift from eight to nine in terms of the dynamic of the team. And, and again, uh, do you, do you have a, a, a specific memory from that 09 championship? Um, like a, a, you know, a favorite swim, uh, something that stands out to you um, because like you said, it was well in the works, you know, a year, a year prior. Yeah. I think a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of a team success is not doesn't happen at that meet, right? I think you'll hear co coaches all over the country talk, like 
yes, that team is, is ready to perform and they perform and, and the, the ball gets rolling and it just goes. Right? But there's things that happen before that that um, set up that first opportunity in those swims. And so we got, we got our butts kicked by Texas in January that year. Um, at the time, um, Garrett was doing his thing and he was there filming um, Auburn in that meet. And so uh, there might be video out there. He's probably got some, but of Auburn um, training for well over an hour and a half after that Texas loss. And it was brutal. And it, and it put guys in a position where they had to choose what type of athlete they wanted to be. Um, and so we went from that Texas meet where we should have done a lot better, maybe not one, but performed better. And we swam Florida maybe two weeks later. And the difference between that Texas meet and that Florida meet was so big. I remember finishing up our dual meet with Florida being like, we're the best team in the country. Um, and when we swam Florida state a couple weeks after that, and I remember guys putting suits on to try to figure out who was going to make the conference team and seeing them blow up and go fast and thinking again, we're the best team in the country. Um, and then SECs rolls around and, and like, again, just a, from our perspective, a dominating performance at that SEC level. And um, I think even Greg Troy after that meet said, that's the best team in the country. And so we had a lot of momentum going into that, that NCAAs. Um, and Texas had a great team and we just felt like we were the better team. And so there was moments throughout that meet where we needed guys to step up and perform. And so it was tough. I mean, it was a battle, but I think that last morning, uh, if you look at the men's turn of backstroke, the guys that we had make top eight or top 16 were from like heat one and two. Um, and <laughs> uh -huh. for us, that just was like, all right, here we go. Like, <laughs> This is, this is ours to win. So let's finish it. Yeah. The, I mean, the 2009 <clears throat> SECs again, my, my memory is, as a young swim fan, I was in high school at the time was, uh, was Matt target dropping the, was it 18, five, 18, four, something like that. Now, Matt, yeah. He was like, <clears throat> I think he was 18.5. I think he went 45 flat in the 100 fly, and he might have been 41 two in the 100. I mean, he it was awesome. Um, and but Matt was his trials for Australia were a week later. I mean, he got off the plane from his trip in Australia and he showed up in College Station. Like, he didn't travel with us. And so I remember being at, at that wow. meet at NCAs and just thinking, all right, what's Matt got in the tank? You know, and so even that 2009 team as someone who was on it, like I knew we could have been better. Like Matt was hands down the best sprinter at that meet. Um, obviously all the credit to Nathan Adrian for winning the 50 and the hundred, you know, doing as well as he did in, in the freestyles, mm -hmm. but Matt didn't score in the hundred fly. He, I think his time for messy seats would have been third or fourth. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had several guys like that at the meet who didn't necessarily perform as well as they did. And so I think our own nine team could have been even better. Um, but, uh, I think that just shows the, you know, the, the depth of what that team had and, and what it was chasing after. And so to, to be able to figure it out on the last day is something, obviously something that's very special to us and that team. Yeah. I, that, that puts a whole new context on it. So, I mean, you know, he, he goes to SECs, completely lights it up a week later, goes to Australia, <laughs> has, right. a, has a trials, you know, a, a qualification meet comes back directly to NCAAs. And I mean, anyone who's been to an NCAAs, not even swimming, you know, just as a fan, that meet is grueling. Um, and that's, you know, that's, it's a long, hard meet prelims, finals of relays. Um, that's, that's really interesting. And that's, again, it's cool to get that perspective of, of you saying, I think, I think we left a lot on the table, you know, but, yeah. but, but you guys were still able to win fairly handily. <clears throat> um so let's so after that 2009 ncaa title uh you regain your title um mm -hmm. that's when you make your first major international team for the usa right yeah rome 2009 yeah um to tell me t had, did you think that you had ascended to that level of okay I'm, I'm ready to kind of kick start my international career now um at that 2009 trials 
I, I knew there was opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, when, when you go from 46, Oh, 100 fly to 44, six, there's something going on. Right. So I had finished 2008. I had uh, finished fourth at trials um, in the hundred fly. And um, my wife likes to remind me, Hey, Tyler, three people that beat you in 08 were all Olympians. Right. So Gil, Ian Crocker and Michael all made, butter, you know, made the Olympics in a fly event, whether it was hundred or 200. Mm-hmm. And Gil had retired, Ian Crocker had retired. And so I knew it going into summer of 2009, technically, I mean, I was the second fastest, you know, based off the, the previous year's results. Right. Um, but you still have to perform. You still have to do it. And so yep. um, breaking through and having that first time where you qualify, there's a lot of stress that goes into it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I believed that I could make that Rome team. We had, I think five or six Americans at Auburn who made that, that Rome team that summer. And so we kind of carried the momentum from the 09 short course season into long course and, and had a very successful summer that year. But um, I think part of that's a team thing. And part of that's just an individual belief thing of thinking, okay, I can definitely be in this at this level now. And I belong to be at this level, uh, but you still got to go and do it. So, um, but yeah, that was a great experience. I mean, I certainly was not prepared to swim as well as I wanted to, um, as most first time international athletes would tell you, like, I just wasn't prepared. I didn't know what to expect. So a great learning experience that set me up for the next few years. Um, yeah. And that's, that's kind of what I wanted to, that was my next question. So it set you up for the next few years, you know, as, as you move through the quad, you know, you were, you were the, you were the hundred flyer for, for that quad, right? You made 2009 worlds, you made 2010 pan packs where you meddled, uh, you made 2011 world champs where you medaled individually again, and then you made your first Olympic team. Um, and so how does, you know, does each year, does it get easier? Just that qualification process? I think you learn how to go through that qualification process better. It doesn't get easier. You just learn how to get faster from prelims to semis to finals. Um, and that's the thing I didn't have in Rome. I didn't understand how to get faster. Now the Olympics, like some, unfortunately I didn't do that. And so I missed the podium, but um, you definitely learn through that trial of, okay, how do I invest in the prelims, do what I need to do, but then save something for the semis and then save something again for the finals. Um, but in terms of getting ready to qualify for the Olympics, the best thing that I think I did that year was we, um, we figured out a way to go to the um, French Olympic trials. So myself and Martin Gangloff, we were working with Lionel Moreau at, um, at Auburn and he was coaching Fred and some other uh, people as well with, and with Brad, obviously, but we, we were able to go to the French Olympic trials and it was this unique experience where you got to be at a meet like that, where there's that pressure and see just the, the tears and the disappointment and like the celebrations as well and realized, okay, this is a very real thing now. Like this is months away and it looks like this and it feels like this. So how can we get ready for it at our meet? And so seeing that in, uh, I think we were in Dunkirk um, for that meet and to see like Fred not make the 2012 Olympic team right, was so powerful for, for me to see that and think if he can go be as good as he is and not make it as good as I've been the last couple of years, I could very well not make it either. So we've got to step up what we're doing and we've got to improve what we're doing. Um, and I think it definitely pushed the bar and raised the bar for training over the next couple of months and, and allowed myself to um, be ready and, and get ready to perform at our trials with all the stresses and the, the doubts that come with a, a U.S. trials meet. Yeah. I, I, again, this is, this from a, from the swim nerd of me, this is such interesting, such cool perspective. Cause I, it's like, I would have never known that about you and, but that makes total sense to, to go and see it somewhere else. Um, I mean, that seems like a very wise and cool experience, uh, 
it certainly wasn't the intent. It was like, let's, let's find a cool meet to go to. And then you're, there <laughs> and you're, like, yeah. you're like, Oh wow. How do, how do I get through this? Um, and so I think, I think I went 51 nine at the finals of that meet. And I remember thinking, wow, I've been busting my butt in training. I went 51 nine. Like, so I know physically I'm capable of more. Um, but now I've got to do it again. So yeah, definitely a unique experience. That, that, I mean, that, yeah, unique, like you said, that is very cool. Um, I was, <clears throat> I talked to Blake Peroni just yesterday and um, I was asking him about his experience at, you know, Olympics and world championships. And he said, you know, it's like, you can compare an NCAA is to an NCAA is cause it's like kind of the same experience, but he said, it's really hard to compare like an Olympics to a world championships or a world championships to world championships, because they're in such different places and, and your, your travel, your prep, your, you know, where you're sleeping, what you're eating is so different each yeah. time. Um, you know, from, from that quad from 09 to 12, did you kind of get that too? You know, you talked about, you learn how to go through the process um, each time you do it, but was, was each international meet that you ended up going to, was that experience very different from, from meet to meet? Yeah. So, well, 2009 was like this cool celebration. Like it just felt cool to be there. Um, Mm. And so I mean, I probably missed an opportunity to perform better because I was just soaking it all in and I mean, thought I was better than I was, you know, kind of thing. 2010 Pam Packs were in Irvine. So we, we, um, we raced in Irvine for trials, top three made it to Pam Packs, um, and, and then performed and got second at Pam Packs. And I think I might've finished that year second or third in the world in the hundred fly and, and, it was comfortable, right? Cause we're home. We're in, we're in the U S um, and then obviously Shanghai, very, very different. But um, yeah, I think going through those meets, you, the unique thing about swimming is it takes you all over the world and you get to see and experience all those different cultures. And so um, by the end, it became more of an appreciation of all the different spots and less of a, well, this is different here and this is different there. And I can't, comparing I never really compared the meets because each right each individual meet was its own and so um going through Shanghai process and we were supposed to be in Japan for our staging camp and uh, the the tsunami had happened eight to ten months prior so we moved our camp down to Australia and I mean I had a great great camp down in Australia and so I knew things were going well and um and so but there's the comfort of being in an English-speaking country and um being around a a swimming community like Australia and um, feeling comfortable there. And then once you're at the meet, like every meet is the same once you're at the meet, like you're just going through your routine in terms of getting on the bus, getting to the pool. Um, You've got your plan for what the the days leading up to your events are. So once you're at the venue, once you're at the hotel, um, life seems pretty normal for that meet and each meet feels more of the same. I think it's the preparation going into those meets that feels a little bit different just because of the different spots you are and you try to invest into the culture and, and where you are and experience the beaches of, of the gold coast and experience France. I mean, we were in, um, Vichy France before, um, I think it was before London. And so to experience that town and that community, I think that's what makes those trips different uh, and special. But once you're at the meet, like it's, it's meet time, it's hotel, bus, pool, back and forth. And that's about it. <laughs> yeah. As uh, having your event be the hundred fly, um, it, it, at world championships at Olympics, is it hard for, because that's always on day six and seven? Uh, it, not, not as much by the end of it. Not as much again, Rome. Yes. Super challenging. Like, okay no idea how to go through the first six days. of meet. <laughs> It's so used to day one of an NCA is like racing day one of, right. of world championships, not racing and, and getting excited and, and thinking, okay, when is it my turn uh, to, to race? But again, by the time you, I got through to Shanghai or to even to London, it, um, it was pretty normal. And so I knew much better how to handle those first five days, how to make sure I was doing the right work and when I was doing it uh, to be able to, to perform 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely a challenge in 2009 of watching guys in the first couple of days swim and be done. Now they're like out visiting the town, visiting, you know, the, the city and having this blast. And I'm thinking, I'm just in this hotel room. I don't want to go do that kind of stuff too. And so you get distracted. And, uh, yeah. But in the end, you, you learn how to go through that and use it to your advantage in the future. Yeah. The, so final question. Um, yeah. So, so how, how would you say you learned how to move through those first five days? You know, you're at a world championships, you don't swim till day six. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, do, do you, do you do have a couple hard practices in there, but you, you know, it's like, you don't want to blow your taper. There's so many, there's so much going on. Like you said, you're seeing your teammates finish up on day two, day three. They're like, all right, I'm going to go explore the town. I'm going to go do this and that. And you kind of have to stay in your zone. Um, how did, what did you find that worked for you to get through those first five days and, and to be ready on day six to kind of give it your best? Um, whether it was meditation or just, um, uh, establishing a routine, there's little things that I, I figure out how to do to keep myself, you know, invested emotionally in the meet and invest in my teammates in the meet and talking to them, but then being able to just kind of stay calm and stay relaxed. And, um, I mean, Brett is one of the best in the world at, at having a plan for his athletes at those meets. And so, after I had that Rome experience, like the plans that I had leading into 10, 11, and 12, like were amazing. And I knew that I was, what I was doing physically in the water was perfect. And so a lot of it became, okay, figure out what your routine, routine is going to be. So I remember always doing like two or three days out doing a traditional swimming stinger and suiting up. And, mm -hmm. but I would, um, get to the pool time, you know, this, this time ahead of when I wanted to race and warm up. And, and after I would warm up, I would sit and wait around for 30 or 40 minutes, like I was going to do, um, on the actual day. And so I really tried to simulate the time that I was going to be at the pool versus just getting up and doing something physical. It was more about the, the spacing between everything that I did. Um, and knowing how long my warm up took and knowing how much time I had between and how long it took me to put my suit on and how far the walk was to the ready area. And then once I got to the ready area, how am I going to move through my visualization of my race in that, in that space um, and build myself up emotionally. So like when I would get into the ready room, it was really important for me to just like be calm and relaxed and, and then find a couple moments throughout the 10, 15 minutes in the ready room where I start to get excited and, and start to think emotionally and visualize emotionally what my race was going to be like. So that two minutes before I actually race, like I've, I'm ready, like physically, mentally, emotionally, I'm on the right edge of where I need to be so I can go and perform. Um, and, and so that's what I would work on two days out and go through all of that and then just simulate it on the race days uh, i to me to me that is a uh, invaluable insight that's that's really cool to hear from you know someone who's been there and pretty much done it all um at the collegiate level at the international level uh tyler i re really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with me for a while no uh, thank you i appreciate it and uh this is this is fun like reliving all this stuff and talking about it and coming up with names i haven't thought about in a long time is a blast and so i appreciate you having me on you've been listening to the swim swam podcast stay tuned for new episodes every week you can take swim swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel for more videos as well